Marnen! Marnen! Welcome to the India Explained podcast, recorded in London and San Francisco. One take, unscripted, no rehearsal. Hey, Manti, greetings from San Francisco and uh, happy, is it what, Guy Fox Day? Is that what it's called? It's, it's bonfire night. So today I'm sitting outside in my back garden, Rohit, in London, and I've got a fire going. Uh, it's a small fire. And our listeners, if they pay, if the sound gets picked up, you can hear in the distant background, small staccato of noises. They'll mm-hmm. come up and down sometimes. And that's basically people letting off fireworks to celebrate bonfire night. So Achha. today's... 5th of November. Remember, remember the 5th of November. Okay. And uh, this was about Guy Fox and the bonfire night uh, and, and this gunpowder plot, uh, which inspires the plot to blow up the parliament. Um, okay. But anyway, we won't uh, talk about that. Uh, but yeah, I'm sitting outside. But the, in advance, I want to apologize to our listeners that in case you hear fireworks, uh, it's, it, I think it's intentional because I thought that it would be interesting to add to the mood. Well, speaking of parliament and all of that, right, that it's interesting that this publication called The Wire, which is a non-profit, and I should just say in the interest of disclosure that I've written a couple of pieces for them, maybe one or two, uh, a couple of years ago, I think around the time they founded, uh, they are accused by critics of wanting to symbolically blow up the Indian parliament or specifically the, you know, parliament uh, as inhabited by the Modi government. They did a story a while ago and we spoke about it, which, uh, you know, mentioned the phenomenal increase in turnover that that uh, a company owned by Jay Shah, uh, son of Amit Shah, the BJP president, uh, had had shown. And they were given a legal notice, and apparently they've challenged the legal notice, and I think the, the decision's gone in their favor. But The Wire has done another story. This time, uh, it's not really, uh, you know, something that is is, is making a legal legalistic argument, so it right. can't be challenged, but it's making a very powerful, uh, in, in my view, strong argument about cronyism. And right. it's specifically about the BJP, but we can make a similar argument about the Congress, I should say. Right. So the story basically says that the National Security uh, Advisor, uh, right. you know, Ajit Doval, who was a member of RAW, I think, uh, he right. has a son by the name of Shorya Doval. And this guy is right. an MBA educated, uh, sorry, Wharton educated MBA. Yeah. Uh, I think he worked for Goldman Sachs, or one of those big banks in the US, and then he came back some years ago and he founded a think tank called the India Foundation. Right. Now, the India Foundation, there was a top, it was a topic of a terrific story by Outlook in 2015. They mentioned that, you know, it's this, it's in a very tony area of Delhi, but it's very unobtrusive. You don't, you know, it, there's a very basic board. Nobody knows much about it. This right. think tank is super powerful. Uh, right. You know, in 2015 or 16, they had an, uh, some something about the economy, or I think it was maybe <clears throat> even before the election, they called mm. finance ministers or finance-related officials from 35 or 135, 35, 40 countries uh, to explain to them what Modi's, you know, the Modi government and Modi's vision for the economy would be if he got, um, you know, elected. And right. I, in the articles I was reading, someone said that, you know, if you're not invited to this, you're nothing. This yeah, right. think tank, as something that is non-partisan or is technically independent, you know, and, and like a non-government, non-profit, it has yeah. ministers from the BJP government serving in various capacities. There's, you know, Nirmala Sita Raman, there's MJ Akbar. It also has as one of its directors, I believe, Ram Madhav, whose name is written as Ram Madhav Varanasi, who's a pretty senior ranking person in the RSS and is now also a minister. You know, he's also a member of the... I don't know if he's a minister. He's also a member of the Modi government. Mm. So, you know, these are just blatant conflicts of interest because this is a third party and you have people from the ministry, uh, actually from the government, from the Modi government actually serving in those capacities. I think it was Shashi Tharoor who pointed out on Twitter that this actually violates a kind of code of conduct that the Indian government has. There's also some Saudi prince or some Saudi sheikh or someone who's involved in this mix. And, uh, you know, finally, I'll just sort of mention that, um, you know, this think tanks have been a really key player for the Modi project of consolidating public opinion. Uh, There's another foundation called the Vivekananda Foundation and uh, Ajit Doval, Shorya Doval's father was involved with that. And that was a complete, you know, right wing think tank. And I think we brought this up in a couple of uh, episodes earlier that the Modi government or the right wing project was very, very was very, very effective in actually using this whole discourse of corruption, right, Mm. as a kind of election plank. But what they did was they used that to get middle class support in the India against corruption movement, which, you know, spawned 
Kejriwal in a sense, it was mm. a com- complete right-wing movement. You know, it was a very smart tactical understanding that there's a kind of anger at the Congress and there's a general Indian anger at corruption. And then those votes were, you know, those databases, those votes or those, that political capital that had been generated mm. was very, very effectively mobilized by the BJP's IT team for them. Mm. So this is this is where we stand. And, uh, you know, uh, some, uh, I know the journalist who's written it a little bit, Swati Chaturvedi. Um, she has the handle of Benjal uh, at, um, on Twitter, and she's done some excellent stories. Uh, you know, she mentioned something interesting that, uh, the, you know, this is not, there is no, there are no legal claims made here. So there's nothing, you know, there's no scope for defamation. Everything is fact-based. Uh, hmm. But apparently the BJP has given the, uh, you know, it's it's not going to send any of its spokespersons and it's send a message out to all the television channels. Do not carry this story. Do not say much about it. Let it just die a natural death. Um, two final thoughts and then I'll turn it over to you, Banti. Uh, a, Shorya Doval didn't really answer the questions that, the wire post to him before running the story and be mm. the finances of this organization are very very sketchy they claim they get advertising but they bring out like you know one article one journal like every three months and even if you have this nominal journal and people are spending vast sums of money to bring out a half page or a full page ad i mean what is that money really for is is i think the underlying question yeah you know um there are uh, so many interesting points to be made uh, on on this one. All of this, you know, Mamata Banerjee sold her paintings, mm. right? Right. So th- this has a painting whiff to it. So this mm. guy, Doval's son, Doval Jr., let's call him Doval Jr. Mm. Doval Jr. isn't in the business of painting. He's in the business of gaming opinions, mm. right? Which is fine. You know, there are people who do that, make a living out of that. In fact, one of the biggest scams going is the World Economic Forum, which is basically a group of very ultra-prosperous people mm. coming together in a very lush context, backslapping mm. each other. So it's almost the counterpoint mm. to the NGO Bazi that you see, which is, you know, uh, mm. Jola Bindi and, you know, the world's wrong and we must put it right. Mm. World Economic Forum that is a think tank where people are saying, the world is right, we are the ones who are making who are it right. It right. It's sort of <laughs> yeah. kind yeah. of social engineering, right? <laughs> correct, correct. So I think I think think tanks, you know, we... we, we, we um, I have a mixed opinion on think tanks. There are some think tanks that do really credible uh, research analysis and uh, feed into upstream policy positions. Uh, and I'm aware and have have had working relationships with some of these think tanks in Britain. So I'm not going to slag off think tanks in general. Now, right. cut, cut to South Delhi uh, randomness where you know this is kind of basically a nameplate. Hmm. Uh, and there is a nameplate and a bank account which hmm. rolls over on the back of you know advertising cash. Hmm. Um, it 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 just seems that you know has this organization with its you know whether it's got ministerial backing or not has it produced a piece of thinking? Hmm. Let's let's forget for the moment uh, you know the money's involved. Has it produced a bit of thinking that has influenced or shaped? Or, or contested any kind of policy. Because two things the think tank can do. Mm-hmm. One is to say that, you know, here's what we've researched and found out, and therefore the policy that needs to come out of this area should mm-hmm. be this. Mm-hmm. The other thing could be that, you know, we've done a bit of thinking, we didn't do any research or anything, but we looked at how current things are operating, and we'd like to contest mm-hmm. this position. Mm-hmm. that they're my, my mood point is, wherever your address is and however you're making your money, you can only be a think tank if you're thinking about something and making a diff- difference. Super so point. Do- Super so point. Do- yeah. do- so Dover yeah. Jr., my question is, what what thought piece has mm. Dover Jr. put in front of people? But, uh, to, to, yeah, to, and I can, yeah, thank you. I mean, these are excellent points. I think you've just gone to the heart of it and, and I'll just respond to that. In fact, this story, I think that the Wire, uh, the story, the Wire, uh, the Wire story, pardon me, and then the Outlook India story both do mention it. They produce things where the ideological slant is very clearly visible. You know, stuff like conversion, threat to India, or, you know, jihadi terrorism and so on and so forth. And, you know, again, one might say, uh, playing devil's advocate, that, okay, they're coming from a right-of-center Hindu majoritarian viewpoint, and one may disagree with the plat- the foundation, but even yeah. within that framework, no matter what one's disagreements are with the assumptions or how problematic one sees them as, they can be good work. That's kind of the model of... I'd say, you know, American 
conservative think tanks like the Heritage Foundation or the Cato Institute, which is you know out and out libertarian, or the Hoover Institution, which is a conservative think tank at Stanford, and you know you go to their uh, website and you'll see that they're very clearly pro free market and they do think Islamic terrorism is a problem in a way that you know a center left or a left think tank would you know would would not sort of propose right they would be right. but within that they produce reports where there's genuine research i right. don't and you know i've not gone hunting for these reports i've not read them i should be right. honest about that but the right. thing is if the work is good it sort of bubbles up you know it turns up it it's commented on it comes into the public sphere the work yeah. itself is just not there in the public sphere so it really does seem that this think tank is a pretext for something else now i don't want to you know sound like a conspiracy theorist here but i i do think there is the larger point and the wire has just stuck to the point of conflict of interest and i think that fundamental point is a very valid point right i think so this guy you know is uh, his dad's close to the administration and on the back of but i think you know what um, let's be fair this is not something that is unique to doval junior there are other fair people enough. who've done it uh and other people in other areas of the political spectrum it's just i think the the difficulty is as you said uh, the whole bjp project was conceived around you know curing india from corruption uh and i think with the passage of time uh you, you suddenly realize that maybe the kind of vision that bjp was holding up uh as being completely above board and beyond scrutiny that that kind of whole veneer is faltering and and there are points i i wish doval junior's think tank all the best you know uh if he produces credible thinking which is yeah. kind of linked to um, our foreign policy positions like having a fight with china at any given point in time or you know rubbing off some other people the wrong way uh best of luck to him if 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 that's what uh, that think tank does and i think what the what begs the question is where where's the con, the counterpoint uh, to these policy positions because in every uh, industry uh, including the think tank business if somebody saying let's go right there has to be an organization that says let's go left right right and i'd be i'd be very interested to seeing you know you know whether there is a kind of a congress backed think tank yeah which takes positions on international policy and and and, and you know just hear them out and see what right. what they do because this guy as you said at one point was saying that you know we'll be overrun with uh, islamic uh, terrorism because of the rate at which demographics are shifting in certain parts of the country uh those are kind of like it seems like very kind of linear arguments but again we qualify these comments by saying that we are not very familiar with doval junior's think tank uh, uh and uh, only because you know it's never made the news apart from in this instance and in this instance he's made the news because of nepotism and uh, we are calling it out for what it is right and you know final point um, uh you know i'll just say that the right their argument has been and one should put forth their argument in the interest of fairness their argument has been that look a lot of the ngos that got support from the congress yeah. uh, you know they were their point is that those are like de facto pro congress ngos now right sorry right. i actually know a couple of people who work in them from a social justice perspective and their point is that this is rubbish it's right. we stand for secular values whatever that is we stand for inclusive values and maybe there is a sorry excuse me a kind of ideological enlighten um, uh, alignment there but right. they say that we have also bitterly and strongly often opposed congress policies there are others who say that the congress was vicious towards ngos that you know didn't toe its line so there's a lot of he said she said going on out here but right. in the right wing imagination in the popular right wing imagination the kind of typical indian ngo jhola wala ngo has been a kind of congress for them it is completely contiguous with the congress so right they right. are basically seeing this as a kind of counterpoint and then right. my my concluding thought is that i think the bjp's credibility is undermined by the fact that you know from the time modi came to power there's been a steady kind of you know stream of misinformation right and i'm not talking about pr right i'm not talking about modi's pr uh, that is what it is uh, but i'm yeah. just saying that you know flat out lies like there was a completely like awful 
awfully like syrupy story about Jaisha that was put out by the editors of the Quint that he's such a good uh, bacha. When his dad was in jail, he used to you know get amras and dhokla uh, fresh from Gujarat, you know. And then earlier there were these stories about Arun Jaitley as you know Mother Teresa, and then there were these stories about Doval himself that he was India's James Bond and. You know, he went undercover in Pakistan, worked as a rickshawala, uh, you know, infiltrated terrorist cells. Uh, he also, like, you know, dressed up as a sardar. Now, if you look at his physical build, uh, yeah. you know, very unrealistic for him to pass as a sardar. And I don't want to, like, stereotype him. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and, and I remember Swati herself, I think it was Swati who wrote this article. She clarified that, look, this is just hokum. At some point of time, he was India's point man in Islamabad. Right. 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 There was an embassy right. and, you know, obviously embassies, even if they're going to put spies, they don't want to call him spy. So he may have right. been, you know, I don't know. He may have been like cultural attack. Cultural, cultural, yes. cultural maybe, you know, officer. Maybe he was, just, you know, his official designation was like guy in charge of stationery, right? To the rest of the yeah. staff giving pe- yeah. weekly pencil rubber. I don't know, man, but that's yeah. what he did. He was never this James Bond figure. But all right. So I think we leave it at that open-ended okay. and okay. we'll come back with another story soon. Okay. Take care, buddy. Okay. Chalo, take care. Bye-bye. Bye.